Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's a great honor to be here with all of you to discuss uh, the, um, uh, the next steps in the climate agenda that, that we have because of the hard work of so many of the panelists. I'll introduce each of the panelists as we go forward, but first, um, I'd like to uh, introduce our uh, introductory speaker. Now, you know, there's, at the end of every year, there's a poll of who had the best year and who had the worst year. And I think it'd be very hard to argue that anyone had a better year last year than Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon. We had the Sustainable Development Goals, we had the COP21 Agreement. And, and, and having worked closely with him for three and a half years, I can tell you that he put his own neck on the line. He put all his political capital into making sure that he left the world with these historic important agreements. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the Secretary General of the United Nations, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Thank you, uh, President Kim, distinguished panelists, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. We have delivered both 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda and Climate Change Paris Agreement. And I thank you for all your strong support and engagement to make this happen. The SDGs and climate change must go together. SDG is ambitious, universal, integrated, and those two are indivisible. All 17 goals, including climate change, must go hand in hand. The Paris Agreement gives the private sector an unprecedented opportunity to create clean energy, climate resilient economies. Governments have agreed on transparent rules of the road to monitor progress, enhance accountability, and foster a race to the top of climate ambition. They also endorse the use of market mechanisms to spur the growth of carbon pricing. The direction of travel is clear. Five steps will move us forward. First, national climate plans must urgently be converted into bankable investment strategies and projects. Second, we must generate sufficient financing for developing countries to bypass fossil fuels and meet high energy demands with low carbon sources. Third, we need greater attention and resources for climate resilience. Fourth, we need to rapidly increase climate actions at every level. I will work to help strengthen this action agenda and public-private partnership. Fifth, lastly, but not least, governments must quickly ratify the Paris Agreement so that it will become effective. I thank you for your strong commitment and engagement. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, you, thank you so much, Secretary General. Um, I, I want to move now um, uh, to really pay tribute to the French government. I remember um, hearing from President Hollande, from uh, Foreign Minister Fabius, from uh, Michel Sapin, the, 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 um, uh, the, the Minister of Finance. Everybody was so focused on getting a deal. Uh, and it's just, it's, it's stunning that we came out of, out of Paris with a deal that's more ambitious than we had hoped. And so I want to pay tribute to the entire, everybody in the world owes a debt of gratitude to the French people, to the French government. After the terrorist attack, you went forward. So we're very, very grateful. Now, uh, uh, one of the things that we all heard, uh, 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 Mr. Minister, was that it was your very soft touch, your invitational approach, not, not, not just to everybody in the, in, uh, among the governments, but also to civil society, uh, to businesses. And so we now have pledges that are just enormous. We have the nationally uh, determined contributions, but we also have what we understand is the non-state actor pledges that cover 150 million people and $11 trillion. So uh, we are also grateful, but now we, we're asking you the next question. How do we take these pledges and turn it into action? Uh, in the Paris Agreement, it has been decided 
that uh, the presidents of the different COPs will uh, choose a champion. Therefore, I said I will choose a champion in uh, some days, and this champion will have the responsibility to check that everything is going uh, in the right place in relation with UN and in relation uh, with uh, the president of the COP. And there is uh, the decision which has been taken that every single year there has to be a special event for these non-governmental uh, actions. My plea, stemming from uh, the experiment of Paris, is that this special event with non-governmental actors has to take place at the same place and the same time as the COP. Because one of the reasons why we had such a success in Paris is that it was not only governments, obviously it was decided, but also private companies, but also local authorities, and also NGOs, and also civil society. And it's really decided that every single year in the future, in the COP, we have a special event where everybody can check what has been done and can propose for the future. If we implement that very ambitious program, things will go in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fabius. So in, in that spirit, let me go to Paul Pullman. Paul has been such uh, a pioneer in bringing uh, climate concerns to, to Unilever. And I'm amazed, Paul, you, you show up in so many places where we're talking about climate change pandemics, and you're still running this huge company um, uh, extremely well. So I'm wondering, Paul, what do we need to do to get the incentives right? One of the things we've been saying at the World Bank Group is that unless we have a carbon price, unless we get the incentives right, uh, we just won't be able to do this. Uh, public action won't get us there. What do we need to do to make sure that these incentives are aligned? One of the things we've announced today, and that's why it's an important day, first of all, the Secretary General has announced the SDG advocates. Uh, I'm honored to be one of those, but we will rally the ad SDG advocates to keep this very high on the agenda, and they're amazing people. And the second thing is we've announced the creation of the Commission for Business and Sustainable Development under the chairmanship of Mark Malik Brown. And that commission has a task to make the business case, because it is confusing for many of the CEOs, it's a broad agenda, to make the business case. My ideal goal will be that everybody will run its business plan and its objectives along the sustainable development goals, that we would actually publish our annual reports to show what contributions we make to the sustainable development goals. And then that commission will look at creative partnerships, new business models, and the financing side. So I hope that certainly will create the momentum. But ultimately, we will be held accountable for what we obviously achieve, not for what we say. So we will be looking at clear measurements, transparency, accountability, as we move this process forward. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Paul. Great. Uh, the Norwegian International Climate and Forest Initiative has made huge commitments and continues to support countries. How are, are you uh, working with the Tropical um, uh, Forest Alliance and wh why all the emphasis on forests uh, um, uh, from your government? Well, it comes out of a national political compromise in 2008 and uh, by a good, uh, a good uh, activism from NGOs saying that we should do something that really counted. And uh, of course you can, as a small country, do higher petrol prices and all of those things that we already do. But, you know, saving the rainforests mm -hmm. is the biggest contribution you can do. Uh, so we, s we made, a, made an all-party uh, agreement that we should fund this. It was slow in the beginning. Uh, but we now have a very good program saying that uh, we pay for results. So we have an agreement with Brazil. We are working on other Amazonian countries. We are doing it with Indonesia. We are doing it in West Africa. We are looking at, uh, at Congo and uh, to see if we can do something there. Of course, but we are not paying without seeing the results. Sure. That means that um, uh, we, we are building up a structure and learning from that with local authorities, with the government. They have to monitor. They have to find ways, and the money we are paying for the results is going back to projects in the same regions so that people can have another livelihood. And it's a practical way of doing it, but it has great, great uh, impact. And of course, it's, it's mainly done by the countries themselves. 
But I think the way we are putting up the plan, and now it's not just Norway, I mean, Britain is participating, Germany is participating, it becomes a larger program because it shows very good results. Thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. We, you know, uh, uh, with, your, with the support of uh, the Norwegian government over many years, we've b built this program for results that has worked in health and education, and we're expanding it now. Uh, Prime Minister Duncan, you and President Ouattara have been very uh, forward-leaning. You've really put together, put together an ambitious plan uh, for Cote d'Ivoire in, uh, in, to the UNFCCC. And in order to achieve the targets, it's going to require quite a bit of money, something like $2.7 billion. So with this group, and some of it will be through public-private partnerships. So with this group here, how uh, will you and President Ouattara and, and, the, and the government of Cote d'Ivoire make the case that investing in climate-related investments in Cote d'Ivoire is, in fact, a good investment? We have a program called the Fafiara uh, Agriculture Program. Uh, of about 4 billion US dollars. Uh, 60% will be uh, contribution from the private sector. Well, the other sector is uh, deforestation, of course. Uh, the share of the forest in Côte d'Ivoire has come down to 13%. Our goal is to increase it to 20%. So we have to plant more trees and so on, so that uh, the, we'll have more forest in Cote d'Ivoire. Well, and then the third sector is transportation. We have uh, yet to modernize our park of vehicles in Cote d'Ivoire. 50,000 vehicles will be changed in Cote d'Ivoire, trucks, cars, and so on. And we have to done it uh, within 10 years. And finally, of course, is the energy sector. We want to change the energy mix in Côte d'Ivoire. Well, now the production is 2,000 megawatt. From now to 2020, we want to reach 4,000 megawatt. We have to double the production because Côte d'Ivoire supplies electricity to the neighboring countries. Uh, eight, uh, five neighboring countries already and then uh, within two years, three other neighboring countries, that will be eight. So we have to supply our, our needs, but also to contribute to give electricity to the subregion. So that's our uh, scheme uh, for the coming years. And if we do that, I think we'll contribute to improve uh, the situation of the climate in the world. Thank you. Sharon Burrow. One of my heroes. Uh, we argue uh, uh, on, 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 uh, on certain occasions, but you have been so clear, so honest, such a great advocate for, for working people. Uh, General Secretary of the uh, International Trade Union Confederation, you've advocated for multilateral partnerships to deliver green growth and, and, and decent, good, green jobs. Um, how can, what can we do now with all the interest from civil society around COP21? What do we need to do to take it forward in a way that we do work in these uh, partnerships? The technology is there if we want to share it, but we won't tackle inequality and we won't tackle climate if the world continues on a business as usual model. If the 1% have all the wealth, if the global trading models based on supply chains that continue to in fact attack human and labour rights and, and uh, uh, decry environmental standards, then nobody wins. So we will also use our capital. Not just will we demand dialogue from governments and corporations, but we will use our capital, $30 trillion of workers' capital, double that if you include our mutuals, invested in the global economy. And so as the uh, proxy season comes along, I want companies to understand that we'll be asking for, in fact, with allies in the investment world, a plan for decarbonisation and jobs from every company, a two-degree impact plan with engagement, and we'll guarantee that we'll fight with you for long-term investment uh, to make it possible. But if and only if companies are prepared to have the plan to make the transition. It will take all of us. Collective action is the only way we can get to that zero carbon, zero poverty future. Excellent. Thank you, Sharon. 
Se Secretary General, I was wondering uh, if you have any thoughts on this discussion. Every government, indigenous communities, they should have a strong ownership that this is my sustainable development and this is my climate change. Then I think everybody will be there. And that is what I'm just asking you. Every decision the business communities will make should keep into consideration that how and what way your decision will be affecting to sustainability, whether this will go in reducing climate, I mean, global temperature rise within, within two degrees. That should be part of our daily, daily life. And that's my observation thank and you. I strong urge that thank you very much. Thank you so much. We're out of time. And let me, let me just get, say to the private sector uh, people in the audience, if you're not working with an internal price in carbon, you should start tomorrow. China is going to have a national carbon trading system uh, by 2017. And if you're not prepared to think about low carbon solutions in your dealings with China, and my guess is that just about everyone in the world wants to do business with China, then you're going to be at a disadvantage. It's coming. Uh, we're, there's, there's no doubt that the, uh, the momentum is with us. We're so grateful to, to all the panelists for taking us forward. We thank you for your attention. And um, please pay attention. And as the Secretary General said, this is just the beginning. Thank you.